Barclay, owner and skipper of the Little Marcy. She's now getting ready to shove off for a trip to the Arctic region. The purpose of our North Coast Barclay expedition is to gather scientific data and to show the medium Cathay News the strange life in this mysterious land. Here we are, shoving off for our trip. The Morris is a fishing schooner about 83 tons, and she's fitted out for six months' cruise. Some friends come down to see us off as we leave the dock, and our cameraman's already on the job as we get underway with our engine kicking us along at about five knots. Only about 60 horsepower, but enough for us. With a last look at the famous skyline, we head up the East River under the bridge, which tower high above us. Once we get out of the river and Long Island Sound, we begin to hit, hoist our sails and hit, to hit the Atlantic swell. The Marcy, being of light draft, begins rolling and tumbling about. Seeing we're in bit for a bit of rough weather, with all those barrels lashed to the deck, we stowed our mains. But with those barrels, full of gasoline and kerosene, likely to break loose in a blow, we wanted the good old Marcy to ride easy. While Jim Crowley, at the wheel, held her steady on her course. The pitching of the vessel didn't bother us a bit, for later we often wished we had enough clear water to feel the keel lifting when the heavy ice pack closed in on our little Marcy. There's the compass, we stare by, and this is the tassel log recording the distance. The hunters of the party kept their eyes in by popping clay pitches from the deck, as we expected to live on the game we shot during our cruise. This is a great sport, but you have to be good to hit anything. And so under a full spread of canvas, we head north on our great adventure. arriving in Brigham, my birthplace, having sailed 1,200 miles from New York, on board my schooner Mars. I picked this little port for a stopping off place, as my crew and I hail from here. With the Mars she moored to the government war, I decided to go up into town for a short visit. A look around bring back memories of my boyhood. Here in Washer's Brook, still running right to the middle of Brigus, just as it did in the old days. And, and there's my home. Not a bit changed in all these years. Here we are again, getting ready to follow the Peary's Trail on my own little schooner, Marcy. Our base is Brigus, Newfoundland. My hometown, 1,200 miles north of New York. Brigus is a quaint old place, so let's take a look around. See those fellas near my little Morris. They're sailing for Cape. And look, millions of them in the water. And at this time of the year, they are caught for food and even used for fertilizer. There seems to be no end to it. Several hundred thousand barrels are taken every season. Sometimes the haul is so good that a whole barrel full will sell as low as a nickel. The farmers drive right into the water to get big loads, which they take home. In a lean year, when fodder is scarce, they even feed Caplin to the horses. They like it as much as we do. Caplin are a delicious food. Why, I've eaten 50 at a time. They're that good. And if you don't believe me, come up and try them. A few of the fish are pickled and dried for the family's needs. But most all the loads are dumped for fertilizer, and it makes the soil very rich. Here's the minister's garden equal to any in America. He's proved we can raise beets and carrots and help little boys grow. In fact, any vegetables can be grown in Brigus, including my favorite, big, juicy tomatoes. Down on the wharf, my men are shifting supplies. 
The boxes contain canned goods, clothing, nets, and moorings for our fishing gear. And then, with everything ship-shaped, we shove off for Reykjavik, Iceland, more than a thousand miles to the northeast. On our way, we run smack into a living storm of wind. We trip the ocean into fury. My staunch little Morrissey buries her gunnel as she heals over. Sailing close haul with my ray of the wash, I keep her headed for Reykjavik, our only haven as we are too far from Riggis now to put about. The whole crew stand by for emergency, and the boys lay aloft with a will to clear foul hazards in the rig. It takes real seamen to weather a blow like this, but my lads are equal to the best, and the Marcy plows through down to the lands of ice. Iceland is a Reykjavik, its principal port, and the funny thing about it is that it's free of ice all the year round. Ashore, instead of Eskimo and sledge, you find a steady stream of traffic, including bicycles. More like Bermuda than the frozen north, our party leaves town by auto, travelling towards Thingvella, where the first parliament in the world assembled a thousand years ago. On the road, we meet the old hermit, who looks like Iceland's Rip Van Winkle. We stop him to ask direction, and he points out to us Iceland's famous hot springs, which have been steaming for centuries. The springs were discovered by the Vikings. This Arctic geyser, which spurts for seven minutes every two hours, gives you an idea of the volcanoes seething below. The Icelanders pipe the natural steam to heat their greenhouses. Here warm, by the hot spring. You find all kinds of tropical plants, and in Iceland of all places. There's plenty of hot water for washing clothes. Those hooked over the tanks are guardrails to prevent the women from falling in while they gossip. Here are a couple of Icelandic bathing beauties, Hulda and Hekla. All the youngsters in town go swimming in the pool. The water is 70 degrees. They have to run cold water to keep it from being too hot. Even beginners enjoy it. Back aboard, my little schooner, Morrissey, we leave the warmth of Iceland for the bitter cold of Denmark Strait, where we begin to strike the floating ice fields that lead to Greenland, our goal. <laughs> And this time, it's about icebergs. I was up to their home last summer, making pictures for Pathé News. On my return, I told Washington that the North Atlantic would be full of them this year. And sure enough, it is. Six weeks earlier than usual. The fellow that named Greenland must have been in the real estate business. It's not green. It's the home of icebergs. Around the rim are Greenland's famous icy mountains. A huge ice cap covers the whole interior, a frozen Sahara where there are no dust storms. In many places, the glaciers break through to the coast. It is from these that huge chunks called icebergs break off every year and float into the North Atlantic, drifting with the ocean currents. Often passengers on a fancy liner will ask the captain to go close enough to kiss a bird, but the skipper who does should have his head examined. Their beauty's all right, but their room is better than their company. A bird can tear the bottom out of any ship, even my little modesty. They might be safe for birds, but believe me, not for ships. Like the fair sex, they're beautiful, but dangerous. Keep your distance and stay out of trouble. Or better still, admire them in Pathé News. The U.S. Coast Guard 
has just started its ice patrol in the North Atlantic as a new crop of bergs floats down from Greenland. Since one of these specters of the North sent the Titanic to the bottom in 1912, cutters have kept a close watch on the drifting masses to warn all ships in their path. Many persons believe that when an iceberg is near, the drop in temperature warns a ship's captain, even if he can't sight it. But this is not a fact. The only way anyone can know when an iceberg is near in foggy weather is to run into it. The bergs often rise as high as 500 feet. Seven-eighths of their weight is underwater. Most of them float on until they are metal by the Gulf Stream, but sometimes gunfire will destroy one. They are nice to look at, but take it from me, their room is better than their company. again and that's my sweetheart the modesty oh boy ain't she a beauty sailing past that bird by golly words fail me she's so handsome but we were sailing around those bergs for more than that we were looking for the great white bear and soon the lookout yelled nano look look he's diving and staying down I never saw the light. Well, I'd be jiggered. See that beggar swim. He was nonchalant, and I forgot and said a few swear words. But he wouldn't listen. Even the Eskimos came out to see what was going on. But it was a bear going on. He wouldn't stay on the ice long enough to cool off. Just like a lot of folks, he wasn't satisfied. When he was in the water, he wanted to be on the ice. When he was on the ice, he wanted to be in the water. He didn't know his own mind, or maybe he was a her. We were flabbergasted. There he goes, beating it for home. So he wished him an early war and sailed on. <laughs> for Greenland, aboard my schooner Modersy, we leave open water for the iceberg zone. These grim, silent specters of the north are nightmares to sailor men, as they float with seven-eighths of their bulk underwater. One like this sank the Titanic. Their room is better than their company. Nearing the coast, we sight the cliffs of Maxley, with Eskimo bells on top. Look at their hair. They've all got a bun on. And here comes the Amaxilic Reception Committee. Of course, they're not wearing silk hats and claw hammer coats, but they're right on the job. They could make the Harvard crew with a stroke like that. The kayaks and umiaks soon pull alongside, and the first to come on board are the children. Even a toothache can't keep them home when a ship comes in. The Eskimo are very primitive and the Danish government is doing its best to keep civilization from spoiling them. Eskimos can do almost anything in kayaks. This expert demonstrates the role. It's pretty hard to do in liquid ice, but it's an easy way to wash your face and get waked up in the morning. Miok is rewarded for his stunt with some mulligan stew from the ship's stores. A rare treat for him, as he generally lives on fish and seal meat. At night, the Eskimo return our hospitality by staging a party. Our last dance before we leave for the uninhabited Arctic. is in the home, even in the Arctic. Taking care of children, husband and dogs, keep their noses to the grindstone. 
Lighthouse fives everywhere, their work is never done. And when one of the dogs howls with pain from sore paws cut by sharp ice, it's up to the Eskimo wife to cut out sealskin boots for him. Chewing the hide softens it. Some job, believe me. That makes them pliable so they can be laced up with sealskin line. The dogs seem to know it's for their own good. Although, like new shoes, the boots are uncomfortable at first. Preparing skins for clothing is a hard job. No Bob Brummel is as particular as the Eskimo man. Every Eskimo wife knows it. For if the garments don't fit comfortable, her husband will wail the daylights out of her. No wonder the women work hard. They hate to be spanked. What a place for a toothless wife. Even the boots have to be chewed. Then cushioned with grass that keeps out the cold and moisture. So at the close of day, with their babies on their backs, native mothers are fit subjects for an artist's brush, like this Eskimo Madonna. Marie Perry gives out few trinkets, and the Eskimo bells get a chance to doll up, imitating their white sisters. Here's one with our best bib and tucker. She'd be a riot anywhere. Next week, we'll all go back to work on the Peary Monument. Meat, good red walrus meat, is the only thing to keep man and dog going in the army. So the Eskimo were just tickled to death to join the hunt, bringing their kayaks aboard the Morrissey. While we headed for Whale Sound, the Eskimo sharpened their harpoons, repaired their kayaks, and blew up sealskin floats. All hands were galvanized into action by the cry of Arwick. Walrus, the water was alive with them, a happy sight. The Eskimos tumbled over the side into their kayaks, paddling like the devil himself to get at the tigers of the north. So we went out in the motorboat to lend a hand wherever we could. It was unusual to see the herd stay on the pan as we approached. But believe it or not, they hated to go in the water. Their hides were sunburned. We're right into their midst, and they're fighting to get away. Bull walrus on the rampage, with harpoons hitting them in all directions. There's Ewe in his little kayak, going right after a tough bull. Look out! He's charging! Well, here we gets him with a perfect throw, or he'd be a goner. The hunt over, we hauled, we hauled in all the walrus we got, hoisting aboard the Morrissey. And here's the prize, 3,000 pounds of juicy walrus, every bit good to eat, and you bet I can eat my share. Next week, I'll show you what the women did in camp while we were out hunting. My, but it's too good to miss. Up in Newfoundland, where they are working at it now, they call it the Swiler Racket. For thrills and dangers and real test of courage, it's got big game hunting skinned a mile. We start from St. John's Newfoundland, home port of the Swiling Fleet. Each year the harbor's all of a bustle and the ships put to sea, for swiling is more dangerous than exploring the Arctic. When swiles are sighted, all hands get ready. Each man draws four fathom of rattlin and other gear for snogging seals. The ship is worked in as close to the herd as possible, crashing the raft at ice while the crew walk away with the hauling line to add to her headway. Then all hands numbering 150 to two hush dangerous leads and thin ice. Many a tenderfoot has lost his life doing this, although some escape with a wetting and the smart ones never fall in. In chasing the seals, the hunters keep them on the ice, away from the water, 
so they can't move fast and are easily caught. After the kill, the seals are skinned, and then the pelts are laced up for the drag across the ice. When a good catch is made, everybody celebrates. Any man who spoils a pelt deserves a hearty kick in the pants, and he gets it too. Look at that baby white coat. She wants to see what's up. Isn't it funny? The female of the species is always curious. We are now aboard my little Morrissey. Bucking the great Greenland barrier, miles and miles of menacing ice. Will Bartlett goes aloft to the crow's nest, where he scuns the ship to the peg. Otherwise, she would be caught between heavy sheets of ice and cracked like an eggshell. This time of the year, the soft cushion of snow is washed off the ice. So when our bow bites into it, it's just like hitting Vermont granite. The impact brings the steel plates in the bell. So we saw off the bent ones to prevent underwater ice from ripping them off. Stuck here for 37 days, we turned to instead of bemoaning our fate. Norcross and Dove are off to explore the barrier leaves, a regular honeycomb of canals. The canals formed by the melting of surface ice are too shallow for anything but small boats. In some places, the water is only a few inches deep. The ridges are beautiful, but very dangerous. The boys are lucky to get by with passing so close to them, as these often cave in suddenly. But they make it all right, and while they're away, we sight a polar bear. Heaving out the dory, we start after him. Look at him go. He swims better than a lifeguard, but he isn't fast enough to get away. So we come up alongside and rope him. He's madder than a march hare and full of fight. If we could get near us now, he'd slap the dory to pieces with his paws and chew us up. But we give him plenty of rope. So he starts for the ice. He gets up on a pan and fights the rope until he frees himself just like Houdini. There he goes, hurrying home to tell the missus all about it. And it's a fine story he'll tell her, I betcha. Our little schooner, Marcy, is jammed fast in the ice pack. We are now making our last attempt to force the barrier by using dynamite. If it works, we reach the Greenland coast. If it doesn't, it's just too bad. Before we free the schooner, we take aboard fresh water, formed by the melting of surface snow. No need to go thirsty in the Arctic. We test the Marcy's bow, and lay wires for the dynamite. It's the only way to clear a lead, as the high explosives will burst hundreds of tons at one blast. My men run to safety. I give the signal, and off go 25 plugs of dynamite. The ice cracks, and we start moving through the lead. All hands overboard to pass the pieces astern, for if the ice sniffs, the schooner now She's a goner. Slowly we move ahead. It seems an eternity, but at last we are in open water. The hard work has made us hungry. So Billy the cook prepares a feed for all. Don't those buckwheat cakes and good maple syrup make your mouth water? Boy, <laughs> that arty grub puts hair on your chest. After dinner, we sight a couple of walrus, which slide right off the ice pan. And look, there's a lone Eskimo coming out to tackle a one-ton walrus 
the fiercest of all Arctic animals. Eskimos hunt these tigers of the north in frail kayaks with nothing but a harpoon. There it goes, right up to the hill. That bull is caught. So lots of little Eskimo babies will have a good feed tonight. coastal waters of the Greenland Sea, which in olden days were favorite sealing and whaling ground. All hands aboard my little Morrissey keep a sharp lookout. Sure enough, we sight a herd of seals, about 500. You only see the top layer as the rest are underwater. These seals are covered with hair instead of fur. So that's why I had to disappoint the girls who asked me to bring back sealskin coat. Then I spot a couple of narwhals. See them playing around. They average about 17 feet long and weigh about a half a ton each. They have very sharp ears and grunt just like pigs. And they can swim like lightning. If you look close, you'll see the ivory tusk which sticks out of the head. It looks like a letter opener. But narwhals never get mail, so it's just an ornament. Narwhals are very graceful when they sound. There goes one after a square meal. We anchor off the beach where the Eskimo had hauled in a couple of unlucky narwhals. The meat tastes just like chicken, so the Eskimo were always on the hunt for some. The natives are so hungry that they're rolling the fattest one up to where they can cut themselves a nice helping of raw narwhal steak. Even the kiddies are wild about it. Look at that knife. That explains why all Eskimo have small noses. The northeast coast of Greenland. When we get there, you'll see some real wildlife in the far north. Come aboard for the trip. As my little Morrissey runs along the coast, I climb down the rigging, having spotted some game a few miles inland. When I hit the deck, I tell my men to take the dogs and go ashore. They're Eskimo dogs and good hunters. As we head for the beach, we sight some Bernicle geese. They get out of our way, but are rather tame, as they are not hunted up here. But they are good eating. Ashore, we start inland with our dogs, and on the way, run across some Arctic hares. They're real Easter bunnies. The Eskimo use their hides for stockings. Pretty soft. We're after musk oxen, as this rugged countryside is their home. They see us, though, and run away. These Arctic buffalo can outrun anything but a dog or a bullet. So we loose the pack and pretty soon have them at bay. When attacked by dogs or wolves, they form a circle like this to protect the young, which are in the center. So we close in and rope a young one. She's pretty shy and needs lots of coaxing. But finally, we get her tied up and return to the Morrissey. We have a devil of a time hoisting her on board. I named her Maureen after an old girlfriend of mine. Then with our clean linen on the line, we take a last long look at the shores of Greenland and head south, homeward bound. Well, we're safely home again and made past the dock. I hope you had a good time as we have. It's a real he-man's country up there. But don't let that stop you women from going up on a summer vacation. <laughs>
Goodbye, and don't forget to visit the Arctic next summer. <laughs> it will at least keep you cool. <laughs> I stood with Admiral Peary in the shadow of the pole, the farthest north that any man had ever been, with wind, weather, and ice conditions all in his favor. He was at last, within striking distance, determined to nail the start and strike to the pole. I had been with Peary Center since 1898. Let me live the trip over again. Our ship was named for President Theodore Roosevelt. And let's follow Peary's trail. Leaving New York, we stopped at several places on our way to Labrador. From there, we sailed north through Davis Strait and Baffin Bay to Cape York, Greenland. From Cape York, we cruised along to Etah, picking up Eskimo and dogs. From Etah, I took the Roosevelt to the shores of the Polar Sea, wintering at Cape Sheridan. There we left the ship and sledged supplies to Cape Columbia. From there, we made the polar dash over drift ice, ending with Peary's discovery of the North Pole. At Cape York, Greenland, we met the first of our 77 Eskimos. Then we struggled to get the Roosevelt through ice like this. In narrow channels, with a strong tide running, heavy flows kept closing in, threatening to crush the ship. We blasted our way out of the ice to reach Cape Sheridan, the farthest north any vessel was ever driven under her own power. Then we sledged supplies to Cape Columbia, using our 200 dogs. We lived like Eskimo the winter through, and then made the polar dash. I broke trail, and the main Peary party followed. Open water was our nightmare. According to plan, Macmillan and Goodson turned back first, then Borup, and then Marvin, who drowned. Near the 88th degree of north latitude, it was my turn to go back. We talked for hours about future Antarctic and Arctic work. I said, by the looks of things now, sir, you're going to do it. And Peary's last words were to me. Goodbye, Bartlett. Take care of yourself. Look out for the young ice. I knew then he was bound to go right through to the pole. Poor Eskimo and Henson, including Utah, whom you see here, went with Peary Oxwa, the great Peary, discoverer of the North Pole.